There's yttrium, ytterbium, actinium, rubidium, a boron, gadolinium, niobium, iridium, and strontium, and silicon, and silver, and samarium, and bismuth, chromium, lithium, beryllium, and barium. Welcome back. In the last video, we talked about instruments that help us detect radiation, such as the Geiger counter and a cloud chamber. In this video, we're going to cover the next stop point, which says describe how transuranic elements are produced. Before we start, I'm going to go over that word transuranic and what that actually means. So transuranic, there's two parts to that word. Uranic comes from uranium. So uranium, uranium just means uranium. And you can imagine transuranic to mean after uranium. So whatever elements come after uranium. And uranium was had the atomic number of 92. So elements with the atomic number greater than 92 are transuranic elements. Now one thing also that's quite important with them, they're all artificial, which means they're mostly man-made, so they don't occur in nature, so we need, to, we need to actually produce them. Unlike carbon or oxygen, where they come in nature, they're, they're natural, these transuranic elements are mostly artificial, so we make them. And there's a couple of different ways we can make them. We can make them in a nuclear reactor, and that's, that's specifically mostly your um, elements, your transuranic elements with the atomic number of 93 to 95, we can use a nuclear reactor to produce elements such as plutonium and neptanium. And these have a long shelf half-life, so these last for, I mean long, generally speaking, not as long as the other ones, but overall long compared to the ones which are a bit bigger, which I'm going to talk about now. So these are the 93 to 95, such as plutonium, neptonium, uh, plutonium and neptonium. So if it's above 96, this is more than 96. These are generally produced through particle accelerators. I'll cover that word in a second as well. And also, when we have hydrogen, bo hydrogen bombs, and this generally in the testing sites, we also found some new elements, transuranic elements, for the testing of hydrogen bombs. These have, a, generally speaking, a very short half-life. So this could be only a couple of milliseconds sometimes, milliseconds, up to a few seconds. Whereas your ones which are 93, 95, so your plutonium, your neptonium, they can last for a couple of um, hours or even longer. And now when it comes to how transuranic elements are produced, I'm going to quickly first, I'm going to cover a actual analogy. I've got three different ways. We've got neutron bombardment, alpha particle bombardment, and the particle accelerator. Now with a neutron bombardment, because the charge is, is, is neutral, so for neutrons there's no charge on the actual neutron. So what we actually do is we grab a neutron, which in this case you can think of it as a bullet. In bullets they move straight, there's no charge, there's no um, magnetism or anything else moving in a different way, so it can actually move straight like a bullet. And it'll hit its target, and then the target will change. So this target will change once the neutron has hit it. And that's neutron bombardment. Uh, alpha particle bombardment, because alpha particles are actually positively charged. These get attracted by different things, by different charges. So in the case of an um, alpha particle, you can view that a bit like a nail. A nail, if there's magnets around, would usually go all the way to the top and bottom. It would be deflected. So to, the way to avoid this is actually by making it go really fast, and then hit its target. So alpha particles move really fast to avoid change in direction. And they also hit its target, and then once they hit its target, there's a change in the new in the target itself. So this target will be different once the alpha particle has hit it. And the last one was the particle accelerator. And the way you can view the particle accelerator is actually you have a human cannon almost, which hits the target. So it's a big iron, which hits another iron, target iron. And again, there's a change after they've hit. And the new element is usually quite big. So this is how we produce the bigger ones. The smaller ones, we usually use neutron bombardment or alpha particle bombardment, such as plutonium and neptonium. But anything above 90 or 100, we use particle accelerators mostly. I'll go over the actual kind of way this works. So neutron bombardments, we have uh, high-speed neutrons, which hits the particle. Again, these were, had no charge because they were neutron. What you can see here is we have uranium, which is stable not stable, but um, because it has a, a atomic number of 92, but this is sort of still more stable than what we're going to produce in a second. 
and this is a natural, so uranium is the last natural occurring element. Afterwards, we'll go into the transuranic elements. So we've got uranium, which we bombard with a neutron. So this is our neutron bombardment, so a high-speed neutron. This is our neutron here. And this neutron is then absorbed by the uranium, and it goes from 238 uranium. It absorbs a neutron and becomes 239 uranium. And that 239 uranium is less stable than the other one, which means it will quickly decay, and it will decay through beta decay, so this is beta decay, and it will turn into neptonium and release an electron. And remember, this was beta decay. And once that actually happens, it's quickly going to decay again for beta decay and produce, produce something called plutonium, which is the, has the atomic number of 94. So that's how we can go from uranium, which is a not yet a transuranic element, to uh, plutonium, which is a transuranic element, through neutron bombardment. We also have alpha particle, particle bombardment. That was a high-speed helium, which is positively charged. So this was, has a positive charge, which is a particle. So in this case, we've got plutonium as our target. This is our target. And this was our projectile, so you can remember that nail we used, that was our helium, so nail projectile. They combine to form curium, so in this case we have 239 plutonium and 4 helium combining to form 242 curium. So three of those helium particles, three of those helium mass went into the plutonium, and one that's left over just left escaped as a neutron. That's how we go from 94 to 96. We can do that for alpha particle bombardment. Now most of these two happen in nuclear reactors. So these we can do in nuclear reactors. Whereas what I'm going to show you next needs a particle accelerator. Now, I'm going to show you a particle accelerator video in a second. But these are really fast moving. Um, they're huge. The particle accelerators themselves are huge. And they have to be huge to be able to bring these to high speed because they actually reach almost the speed of light. So, almost speed of light. In this case, we have our um, target, which is our bismuth. This is bismuth. This is our target. And this is our projectile. So, the human cannon is nickel. So, we shoot a nickel into bismuth. And then it becomes a huge element. So this has the, the atomic number of 111, that's very big, and that's rentinium, and it also loses one neutron as well. But this rentinium is very, very um, unstable, so it quickly decays again. But this happens in a particle accelerator, and I'm going to show you a video of a particle accelerator in a second. Before I do, I'm going to quickly go over it just in picture form as well. So here we have our human cannon, or our nickel, projectile. And what you can actually imagine is this goes, there's a magnet on both sides. This actually helps to keep it moving in a straight path, but also electricity to speed it up. So electricity and magnetism both combine to make it go straight and speed it up. It will quickly hit the bismuth. From there, those two combine and form the two other ones, ruthenium and in a proton, this is the, the, sorry, the neutron, which escapes as well. And that's how a particle accelerator works. They combine at very high speeds, almost the speed of light, and then we have two new, part, no, two, two new products formed, octanium and neutrons. I'm going to show you a video about that now. <laughs> I'm standing 100 meters below the ground at CERN in Geneva. And this is the CMS detector, part of the largest and most complicated scientific experiment ever attempted. Here, we'll recreate the conditions that were present in the universe less than a billionth of a second after the Big Bang. How do we recreate those extreme conditions here on Earth? Well, you need one of these, the Large Hadron Collider. 
27 kilometers in circumference and filled with over 2,000 superconducting magnets, each at 1.9 Kelvin. That means that they're colder than the space between the stars. Inside here, we accelerate protons to 99.9999999% the speed of light before bringing them into collision inside four giant detectors. What I'm going to do now is I'm actually show you an animation as well. So here we have our neutron, here we have our uranium, and when we slam that neutron into our uranium, it picks it up to become 239 uranium. From there, it becomes decays, beta decays into neptonium, neptonium beta decays into plutonium. Now we have plutonium here, and that's still unstable. But that's how we created 94 from 92. Alpha particle, we've got a helium particle here. It's going to slam into plutonium particle and create curium by absorbing it. A particle accelerator, we've got a nickel here. For high speeds, because of that electricity and magnetism, will slam into the bismuth and create ranctunium. And that will quickly decay and form different products because it has a very short half-life. So I hope that was useful. But yeah, so you have to describe how transuranic elements are produced. And the main ways they are produced are these three different ways. Neutron bombardment, alpha particle bombardment, and particle accelerator. And you can use analogy, I mean, as a bullet because it grows straight. There's no change in direction when it comes to neutrons because they have no charge. Positive are like a nail which has to be gone, which has to go really fast to avoid changing direction because it's magnetic. And a particle accelerator is like a human cannon. It's a huge iron which slams into its target. But yeah, hopefully that was useful. Thank you for watching.